Hey you guys, I uh, want to share a game with you that I just played, a really convincing game. My opponent's over 1500 and it was in the Vienna and it's in quite a, one of the more rare lines that you'll get. Um, but it, it's something that you will see that I've seen plenty of times. In fact, let me, I'm going to pull open the um, Explorer and see how many times I have actually faced this. And what it is, it's um, it's a d6 move on, on move two, okay? So I'm going to go to my games as white, uh, e4, e5, okay? Then knight to c3, the Vienna. And this is the move that we're looking for, d6. It's kind of quiet, blocks in this bishop, um, but it's um, actually the fourth most common response, okay? Most common, knight to f6, and then we can go into the Vienna Gambit. Very effective at this level, and then most of the time you'll see the Gambit accepted. So there, pawn, and then e takes d4 is the most common uh, response. You get about a third of the time, maybe. Something like that. Other response is knight to c6. If they knight to c6, then you bring out your bishop. If they then bring out their bishop, you get this queen trap line, which is lots of fun. There, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, so I remember I used to watch like videos of Eric Rosen, John Bartholomew, people like that, and think, how on earth can you remember those, you know, that many sequences of moves? I mean, I, I, I could just about remember the structure of the London system, you know, two years ago. Um, but it comes through study and and training, and also making the videos as well, as has to be said. Okay, so we've gone back to the beginning. Da -da. Right, this third one, bishop c5. Bishop c5, heap of fun. That's the wayward queen line, and you're attacking this pawn. Uh, that's always good. But the fourth most common is this one, d6. Okay, so... Let me show you what to do when you face d6. So this is my the game I just played against a 1500 rated opponent. And, you know, he got absolutely decimated. Right, so, e4, e5, knight to c3, the Vienna game, and the quiet little d6. And what we go into now is the Omaha Gambit with pawn to f4. Okay, so what you're doing is you're tempting your opponent to capture, right? which in this game he does. Um, I don't know how common that is. So the computer actually has black slightly better even at this point. Uh, you now play your queen out to f3. And this is one of the moves that black's gonna be tempted into playing, right? Queen to h4 check. Because he's thinking, um, look, I've got a pawn covering this square, so he can't block with the pawn because pawn takes, pawn takes, and the rook falls, but not so fast, black. G3 anyway, right? G3, because look, now that the G pawn has moved, the queen on F3 is actually protecting the rook on H1. And in the game we had F takes G3, H takes G3, right? And now, black's queen is actually under attack twice. And where is black's development? Look at this, we've got a couple of pawns out, queen, knight out, we're going to think about castling, queenside now. And what's more, not only has black got no development, but he's got to move his queen on move six. So the queen, this is the best move, probably what you'll see every time. So what black's saying is, please take my queen and then at least I can get some development for free. And you say, oh no, you don't. Okay, so this is what I did in the game. Knight to d5, a signature attacking move in the Vienna. Okay, attacking both the queen and c7. How many times have we seen that, right? Now, in the game here, black blinked first and grabbed my queen. I'm like, thank you very much. That will do nicely. I now have two knights developed into the middle of the board. Black has bugger all. He's, he's got one little pawn shuffle to show for it, that, that awkward little d6 at the start. He's got a, a knight looking down on c7 with a king rook fork, okay? And this is, this is a great position. Okay. So knight comes out now to a6 in an attempt to defend that. And I just go, and, and this is the thing, right? 
You notice how we, we've I've, I've said a few times recently how um, bishops. One of the reasons why you develop bishops later than knights, as a general principle, is that bishops can sometimes play a part in the game without having ever done anything. Right? They can say, "My light square bishop here hasn't." hasn't moved so far in the game and now goes boom snipes out a knight bang explodes right pawn takes knight takes c7 and no one would want to be black from this point in time i get the rook okay i'm gonna i'm gonna lose my knight but hey ho so d3 getting ready to bring out my dark square bishop i could castle here um or you know because there's no queens I might even, at some point, decide just to centralise my king and push my pawns up. We'll see. Okay, so he takes the knight. I now come in. So I'm just in attacking mood here. So I'm looking at undefended pawn there and an underdefended pawn there. Knight comes out here. Good move here. Blocking this pawn and defending that one. So I move my rook over now to say, okay, well, let's have a look at this pawn then. Okay. Now he pushes. I retreat. Again, with a discovered attack against this knight by my other bishop that also, you know, hasn't even taken off its tracksuit yet. Okay, so develop the bishop, maybe get ready to castle. This bishop develops with an attack on a7, and actually, black has no, no means of protecting this pawn. So he throws a pawn up the board, I grab the a pawn, his bishop comes out, I castle. And... Uh, you know, he's got a really exposed king. His pawns are in bits. Yet, yeah, he's got the bishop pair. Okay? So, that's what he needs to be using. Okay? So, when you've got the bishop pair like this, you, you probably want to be thinking about opening up the board. You throw these pawns up, get them, get them off the board, and try and launch some kind of attack at your opponent's king. But it really is a desperate situation already for black. Okay. So... One thing he has to his advantage is he has Harry left. Okay, so he, he has a pawn advantage in the FGH channel. So that all makes sense. So I drop my bishop back here, so I'm over protecting this square. One, two, three. Okay. My opponent forgot how to count and pushed his pawn anyway and lost it. Takes, takes. Okay. And now brings out his bishop with check. I just sidestep. Puts his bishop there and Boomio. Boomio Iglesias, look at that. Okay, now, this is another tactical pattern that, that is good to recognize. This knight here is guarding, not that, is guarding all four of these squares, okay? So when you can attack two pieces like this, right, this rook now, okay, um, cannot defend the bishop even if this knight and this pawn weren't there so it, it, the rook can't go there to defend the bishop and it can't go there to defend the bishop either because all those squares are guarded by the knight so this is like the knight square you can get a similar thing sometimes with a king and these, these four squares around it okay but this is this is a good one so now the the bishop cannot be saved so my opponent here decides to move the bishop and give up the exchange rather than giving up the whole bishop. Which kind of makes sense arithmetically. Okay, so now I bring my rook out onto the open file, attack the knight, attack the king, and come round to a7, looking at this pawn. There's only one square, one way for black to defend the pawn, which is bishop to here, but then c4. So what I'm doing now is I'm deciding that, okay, really, really key thing, and this is one thing, you've got to remember this, right? Write it down if you need to. We're in an ending where my opponent has both bishops and I only have one bishop. <clears throat> so, in that situation, you want to put your pawns on the opposite color squares to the bishop that you've got, right? Now, what this does is, so if I put all my pawns on light squares, my bishop still has full mobility, Black's dark square bishop still has full mobility, but black's light square bishop is, is compromised, okay? So we've got two strong bishops, which can neutralize each other to a degree, but we want to weaken seriously black, um, your opponent's other bishop by putting all your pawns on the same color squares as that bishop, right? 
So easy to remember. And that's so now the bishop has to has to move. Um, I hit it again. Figure why not just finish the the job of putting all my remaining pawns on light squares. The bishop has to move. Pawn falls. Uh, now I squeeze up with my d pawn, looking to come up to d5. Bishop moves. King starts to centralize. Attack. Counter attack. So now the bishop is going to have to come to here because it can't go to there to defend the knight. And now I attack the bishop again. And at this point, my opponent actually abandoned the game, but in a completely, completely lost situation. So um, that's the, the Omaha Gambit. Um, there are a few other things that can happen. So you, you play this. They don't have to accept the Gambit, right? There are various things that they can do. They could bring out their knights. They can even try Queen H4 check now, at which point you play G3 and just shoo the queen away. Okay. Um, but accepting the Gambit, this is the, the one to remember, okay? So when you see d6, play f4. When you see d6, f4 takes and queen f3. Okay, and the key thing is that you are actually defending that rook there. Um, and you should have an absolutely fine game. You know, if your opponent just plays normal stuff, right, you just carry on and grab your pawn back, castle that way. You've got two, two central pawns, your opponent doesn't. Um, so it's it's like a twist on the Vienna Gambit, really, guys. So there you go. Um, that's basically what to do. Um, I've only just started really developing any kind of notes on this myself. So uh, when I've got more to share with you on the Omaha Gambit, I will certainly do that. Um, other than that, thanks for watching. Appreciate your support. Please subscribe to Chess Bootcamp if you haven't subscribed. I'll see you soon.